So this is this strange thing that Jesus does. He, uh, uh, did we start this camera up? It's on and running? Because some, some, once before, it, it got cut off a little bit at the beginning. It's good. We're good to go. Okay, so um, so Jesus tells them about this. Uh, this he, he's predicting, and he does this several times in the Gospels. In, even in Mark, the shortest of the Gospels, at least three times, he tells them, you know what, this is what's going to happen. And he keeps telling them. He then began to teach them, the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and the teachers of the law. So this is a gathering of those characters. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if this is from, uh, the, uh, what, what's that, uh, the, the Passion of the Christ, I think it is, yeah, the Passion of Christ. So th this, and actually, this is the kind of stuff and the headgear those guys wore in those days. So the high priest, th there was a, a group called the Sanhedrin, which, which was the council in Jerusalem where the, of the Jewish leaders, and they were the ones who rejected Jesus, who basically uh, condemned him to death. They couldn't get him killed, so they took him to Pilate, uh, who had that power, and off they went. So that he... He would be rejected, he would be killed, and after three days, he would rise again. Uh, all of which were absolutely bewildering to his followers, and probably, you know, how when you hear traumatic things, your brain shuts off or kind of tries to ignore it. Uh, I think that's what, what happened, but they, they remember it later on. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and, and began to rebuke him. So he spoke plainly about this. So he didn't, he didn't hide it. He didn't shy away from it. He was, he, for some reason, he wanted them to be crystal clear, uh, maybe sort of prepared, although they really weren't. Maybe unconsciously they were a little bit prepared. Uh, not so surprised when it finally did happen. It wasn't this too, too far after this. But uh, Peter takes Jesus aside, and he begins to rebuke him. Interesting. Kind of hard to imagine rebuking Jesus, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll come back to that, though. It's not as hard to imagine as you might, you might suspect. So, it, it, uh, you know, it, Peter really cares about Jesus. He loves Jesus. When somebody you know, somebody you love, somebody you care about uh, is going to go through some kind of a hardship, you try to comfort them. Or, or if you think maybe they're just making it up and imagining it, they say, no, 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 no. Because you know, sometimes people think the worst. You know, they, they, they're kind of cup half full types, you know. <laughs> this horrible thing's going to happen. No, 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 it's not going to happen. It's going to be okay. It's going to be good. Um, and, and sometimes, a lot of the time, that's what you need to say. We need to say those kinds of things. In this case, it was the wrong thing to say. So Jesus is, or Peter's rebuking Jesus, uh, and he, he thinks to, 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 to kind of save Jesus from this mental anguish. So uh, I've got this kind of, um, <laughs> Peter's being the superhero. I don't know where I found this up. So he's, he's getting rid of all that suffering talk. Let's get rid of that stuff. We don't need that. He's a superman. I'll get rid of this. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. So, so you get the rebuke back. So <laughs> you got to watch when you rebu rebuke Jesus that might come back at you somehow. So, and this is exactly what happens. He rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan. He said, you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Hmm. Now this, this should create for us a little bit of a concern, <laughs> being humans and all. What does this mean? Um, he, says, he says, get behind me Satan, to Peter, who's trying to comfort him. Okay, that's kind of strange. Uh, and then he says, you don't have in mind, you don't care about the concerns of God, the things that God's after. You care about the things of men. So then human concerns. The word is anthropos. That's when we get the word anthropology. So it's human concerns. The things of humanity. So it almost seems like he's set up a dichotomy or a difference between the, the concerns of God and the concerns of men or, he, or people and he's put Satan on the side of the people. I don't know. That's how you read it. That's how I read it. So, so he says, get behind me, Satan. You care only about the things of men, not the things of God. Okay. Interesting. So uh, I thought how to explain try to explain a little bit of this biblical perspective on God, Satan, and humankind. So you got, you got God and Jesus. Jesus represents God. He's God the Son, kind of here. On the other side, up against, you got Satan, who's the name, the name Sat, Satan, Satanus is, is the Hebrew word, and it means adversary. 
So most of the time in the New Testament, so that, that you find that in the Old Testament, it's a Hebrew word, a Hebrew name. In the, in the New Testament, we get devil or devilus, the devil. And it's basically the Greek version, which means adversary as well. <laughs> so, um, and they're both after these guys. For some reason, we are the spoils. We are the trophy. Interesting. I mean, that's kind of a crass way to put it, but it's almost like it's a prize fight and the trophy is you and, you and I. So there's a battle over our souls. I think it's C.S. Lewis. Once again, I, I didn't get this looked up and I just kind of remembered it. He's, he has some line like, uh, um, e each square foot of the world is, is claimed by Satan and count, or claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. And it's back and forth. There's a, there's, a, there's a battle for territory. And that battle is essentially the souls of, of the human race, people. Uh, so that, that's the perspective, if you, if you read especially the New Testament, that we have. So um, this is, this is, these are God's tactics, if you will. <laughs> he will not insist on his own way. So uh, he wants us, but he always woos us. He always woos us. That's why people say, well, why doesn't God just tell us? Why doesn't he show us? You know, God, ha his ways are kind of quiet because he's, a gent he's gentle and he's humble. And he's loving, and he will not insist on his own way. He won't force us to go his way. So his ways are ways of love. He tell, then he tells us the truth. Uh, you, read, you read the Gospels, it's just, it's just truth, truth, truth. <laughs> read, the, read the Bible. It doesn't shout at you. It just says, oh, this is the way it is. And you can choose to accept it or not. Uh, he, he uses patience, incredible patience. When I think about my life, I feel like I'm about 40 years in now to uh, walk, starting to walk with Jesus starting to clue in a couple things. <laughs> oh, the patience of God. <laughs> Always amazes me. Mercy, every morning, the mer his mercies are new every morning. So tons of mercy and, and life. Uh, I, you know, he gave us life to start with. And, and, and good, good life is his gift. Eternal life. There's a word, the word in the Greek is zoe. Some people are calling the kids zoe nowadays. Is, you know, I don't know if there's any zoes here today, but zoe means, is the Greek word for life. As opposed to the word bio, which is another Greek word for life, but it's kind of like physical life, Zoe is more like real, the life, uh, and, and it's used when, when the Bible talks about eternal life. So it's a quality of life that comes kind of from heaven, from eternity, that's actually always, already flowing into us through Christ, through his spirit. Uh, on the other hand, this guy's tactics are more like this. Lots of lies, lots of deceit. Um, it, Scripture, New Testament says he, he's the, the one, he who deceives the whole world, or the deceiver of the whole world. He's got a, got a, a general, he's got, got everybody dulled and thinking something is true that isn't. Uh, could get into details, but that's another day. Fear, uh, he preys on our fears and, and amplifies our fears and uses our fears against us. Slavery, kind of the summation of all those things. Sin. Uh, sin is, is slavery. So if, we, if we're caught up in sin or some kind of addiction or self-destructive behavior, uh, he will, he will get, jump on that to keep us, keep us there. And it could be something that looks good. Like, like pride, for instance, is, is, is a kind of a slavery that uh, is, is widely accepted. Stealing, not accepted so much. <laughs> but arrogance and pride is pretty much uh, tolerated by our world. Uh, and, and, of course, death. So... Uh, Basically, d death is the thing he's, he's after. Remember back in, in the garden, he, God says, you know, if you eat of this, you will surely die. He says to, to, to Eve, he says, you won't die. <laughs> but then they die. So then the, the, the long story of Genesis as it unfolds is so-and-so and so-and-so came along and he lived so many years and he died. So he lived so many years and he died. So death has come into the world through sin. And so all are heading for death. So, but, it, but the New Testament tells us that that the devil actually has the power of death in some strange sense. So that probably goes back to that, those events. Uh, so God's answer to this, God's answer to release us and to, to have the victory is, is the cross. The cross is the, the means by which he, he, he beats the devil, if you will, to, to put it in the simplest form. And which is, again, an, uh, an irony and an, an oddity because, you know, if that's the devil's game, did he not win? <laughs> But so here's this is explained in uh, Hebrews 2:14. Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. So he kind of talks about the incarnation. The Son became flesh and blood. He was he was he existed before. So he 
you, the pre-existing son becomes flesh and blood. He becomes, um, uh, becomes Jesus. For only as a human being could he die. And only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Interesting scripture, right? So by his death, he breaks the power of the devil who has the power of death. Now, uh, implicit in this is also, of course, the resurrection because uh, he didn't stay dead was the point. So th that's a, the beginning of an explanation of what we're looking at here. <laughs> and uh, I think these are important things for us to learn. Um, there's this thing called the... Uh, What's it called? Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. So anybody that studied psychology somewhere along the line probably bumped into this. It's kind of an explanation of, of what makes us tick as human beings. Um, and I don't know if you can read it from there. So the, the bottom, basically, these are the things that we need as humans. We, we, we need the ones on the bottom most of all. And then as, we, as we, we find those or we have those, then we kind of build on top of those. So, so it is a pyramid. So the bottom is the, our basic, basic physiological needs. We need food, we need clothing, shelter, those kinds of things. Uh, so once we have those in place, if, and a lot of the world just struggles to have that on a daily basis, right? Chunks of the world. Then, then we look towards safety, physical safety. So security, we want, we want our kids to be safe. We want to have some rules in place. We want to, you know, we want to have speed limits. We want to have uh, cops and uh, you, you know, th those kind of security nets around us. Then, if the, once those things are kind of in place, then, uh, you know, we, 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 want, we need others. We need society. We need social gatherings, group memberships, friendships, social connections. And that includes, nowadays, of course, online connections. It's the biggest way people just connect. They can't stop connecting because you can connect. <laughs> I'm having this, uh, my, bro my brother's going to make me read a book. And uh, he was here last week, I guess, was it? Yeah, and uh, it's got this word in it, um, excarnation. So I'm talking about incarnation, about how God actually became one of us, so he, he could be he could be one on one, face to face, flesh in the flesh with us, and that's kind of the bottom, the bottom line story of the gospel and how it works, is that we're we're actually the fle we're flesh and flesh and blooding God into the into our society, you and I, as we as we walk around in and and do what He calls us to do, and so. He, makes us wonder a little bit about the whole online thing. I mean, it's, it's a very useful tool. I'm not saying it's bad, but if we just simply go to it and, and our relationships are all through that, that's excarnational. We're not, we're not, we're having out-of-body connections. <laughs> so I don't know. That's just something I started to think about. You probably thought it all through by now, but uh, I'm just... I'm <laughs> so excarnation, uh, but, but, but that is the way people connect socially. Um, now it is. Esteem. Approval, recognition, self-confidence. People build that, and that often comes from the, th the, the, the layer below where you know, we have people uh, affirming us, and there, therefore we begin to get esteem. Then on top of it all, we, we, the crowning glory, our self-fulfillment, uh, which he's got a little couple of accomplishments. Uh, pride, interesting. Uh, mental growth, yeah, so, so we're actually getting mentally improved. Now, you see, that's the normal life. That's what we lo long for. That's what we look for. That's what we hope for for ourselves and others. So that's puzzled Peter. <laughs> Does he look puzzled? Yeah. It's the best puzzled guy I could find on the internet. Um, puzzled Peter, he, he doesn't... So, so with that in mind, that that is what you want for someone else, Jesus is saying, okay, I'm going to just cut it all off and put it, shove it all aside. Because if you go and get rejected, you lose all that stuff. You lose your esteem. You lose what looks like you lose your fulfillment. You definitely lose all your friendships because they all drop off. So he's lost all the top. Safety and phys physiological needs when you, get, when you get tortured and crucified, all gone. So he's cutting, just cutting it all right out. And naturally, Peter is saying, no, you, you, you don't want to go there. There's no way that's going to happen. Surely, if you're, you're God's person, he's going to protect you from that kind of thing. See, his logic makes perfect sense. But Jesus is, is trying to teach him something else. There's, there's something else going on here that necessitates him doing that. Um, so I just kind of, kind of, that's kind of parallel to the last thing. I was thinking about these things. These are our human concerns. Self-preservation, self-improvement, self-replication. That's where we have kids, <laughs> grandkids. Or it, it could be where we have 
you know, some of us we may not have children, but we like to we like to leave our legacy. So we mentor others and we affect others and we you know we we pass ourselves along that way. Self esteem, self confidence, self fulfillment. Like those are all pretty important, big buzzwords nowadays. Maybe have been for centuries, I don't know. There's a, there's a key part to each one of these words. Self. <laughs> hey, what, what's a picture you take of yourself? A selfie. So, uh, <laughs> self's a big deal. Um, only one problem with it. It tends to be self-interested, self-centered, and selfish. <laughs> so, th that, so th how to explain this? Th this? I struggle with this. I'm not sure I, I've got it myself, but I, I've been thinking about this for a lot of years. There, there's different things in the Bible. I mean, there's this thing, this concept of sin, which is not the, the same as self. Self is just yourself. I mean, there's nothing inherently evil about self. But it's when self is directed back in on itself, and our only interest is ourselves, uh, that there's something wrong, there's something haywire. And that basically is the story of sin. Sin. So, so this is, I, it's, I couldn't find it, but the, some of us have taken that crossways course with the Harry Went, and he's got all these symbols for things. And his symbol for, for sin is something like a circle that goes back in on itself. So the human race, that's kind of what's happened to us. We have, we have been bent in that direction, whereas the plan was more that we would be like this. We would have the same, we would have the same concerns, but they wouldn't be out of balance because our, our main focus would be upward towards our God, our maker. We would have communion with him. We would walk with him. In, in Genesis, it says, it, it implies that God was, would be walking with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day, walking and chatting and having intimate conversation with him. And that's the norm that is, uh, that is lost now. And uh, so God has an answer for that, which is the cross. We have the next bit. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their soul will destroy it. But whoever destroys their soul for me and for the gospel will save it. So I've, I've actually, so I've highlighted a couple of the words here. Uh, this, we, we already read this in the passage. Um, th this, is, this is Christ's plan and his teaching about what it means to be a follower of his. So if you're serious about being a follower of Jesus, you need to take this seriously because it's very plainly put. Deny ourselves. What does that mean? Uh, take up the cross. So there's something to do with the cross. There, there, there's something that's parallel to what Christ is going to go through. It's funny that the kids said, fell right into that. You know, what does it mean to follow somebody? Do, what, do exactly what they do. <laughs> well, we're not going to do exactly what Jesus did. None of us is going to go get crucified like Jesus did. But, well, that we know. It's not the usual thing. I mean, possibly some did in the early church. It uh, doesn't happen like that so much anymore. People do die. But there's a t somehow the cross is going to touch on our lives. And uh, Jesus is saying, you need to take it up. Take up your cross. Forever wants to save their soul. So the, the actual word it, where it's translated life uh, in the, the Bible passage I read before is, is actually in Greek the word psyche, uh, which better probably translates as soul. So it can go as soul or life or self. In this case, it's soul. For whatever, whoever wants to save their soul will destroy it. That's the actual language in the Greek. <laughs> if, you want to, if you try to save your soul, you're going to destroy it. Weird. And it, wh but if you destroy your soul, for my sake and the gospel, you'll save it. So strong language. Does he really mean literally you must destroy your soul, wipe it, obliterate it off the face of the planet? No. I mean, he's, he's using hyperbole. That's why it got cut in the English version, <laughs> which so often happens. But G Jesus is using hyperbole, and this is the language he uses. You know, if you, if you, if you try to save your soul, you'll destroy it. But if you destroy it, you'll save it. Weird. Uh, so th this requires some thinking and some, some uh, life discipline <laughs> to, to sort it out. Um, so, yeah, just to remind us, psyche in the Greek means soul or life or self. And it, it's, it, it's kind of an ethereal thing. It's kind of hard to describe it. We know we got one, although some of the atheists would, would deny it. We have bodies, but inside them there's something that in us that is... You know, it's got per personality, because we're all different from each other. 
We've got different personalities. We've got different emotional makeups and inclinations and giftednesses and uh, tendencies, strengths of will, uh, ways of thinking. Uh, all those things kind of whole, and ma many other things kind of add up to be the soul. And uh, the, you may recall from a few months ago, my symbol for the soul. <laughs> yeah, kind of, kind of hard to make a picture of the soul. But what Jesus is suggesting here is that somehow the cross must touch the soul life. So I put that there. So it, it, it's not going to obliterate your soul life, but it's going to bring, bring it back from being bent. It's going to touch it and, uh, in order that it be in its proper place. Because the soul of the human beings now has kind of got, got, uh, got out of hand. There's a an interesting kind of parallel or connected passage in 1 Corinthians. This is in the, uh, I the chapter that Paul writes all about the resurrection of Christ and the meaning of the resurrection. So this is on in. It's uh, verses 45 to 49. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. And that's the actual, in the Greek, my version, again, says a living, living being, but it's, it's actually the word soul. And so that's a quote from Genesis. The first man, be Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. Now, the last Adam is his word for Jesus. So Jesus ha has brought about a change in the human race. He's a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth. That's Adam. The second man is of heaven. That's Jesus. As was the earthly man, whoop, as was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth, and as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. That's pretty key. Just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, we're all human beings, that we have natural bodies and the whole thing. He says, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man, which is Jesus. Uh, elsewhere, he says, we, we don't know what we'll be like, but we'll, we know we'll be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, his nature is to be a life-giving spirit as opposed to a living soul. Interesting. So, and this is already at work in our lives. So if Christ is in you and God is, and you're following Jesus and the Spirit of God is leading you, then what's going to be being developed in us is, is not so much the soul life, although we'll have a healthy soul because it'll be, it'll be in its proper place under the, the, the driving force, which is our spiritual being which is that which is connected with the living God through Christ. So once you're connected to God, you begin to be, become a spiritual woman or a spiritual man. You're a spiritual person. And you're to, to derive your strength and your, your uh, motivation and your, 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 your life force, if you will, from, from God himself. And that, that has a huge impact on the life of the soul. You know... I didn't really realize this until I started teaching them about it today and speaking about it. We don't talk about this stuff very much. <laughs> I got some interesting books on this kind of thing. But if, you, if you really want to delve into it a little bit, a little bit more. So, so there, there's a, this is then, uh, and I think part of the reason people shy away from this passage is it does kind of seem like it talks about things like suffering. Uh, and it does. But you know what? We're suffering anyways, right? Uh, suffering can be pretty much expected in life. If you, if you are born into this world, you're going to be born into a world in which suffering is the norm. Try as we might, we cannot prevent our children from going through hardships and difficulties. Uh, so perhaps it may be sickness of, of various kinds. <laughs> um, you know, I, I know you think she's hungover, but she's supposed to be having morning sickness, which is, is suffering. Um, it, I just put that up to represent any, any and all kinds of, of sicknesses. Um, aging, you know? Aging brings with it lots of aches and pains, and when it's time to get up in the morning, you're like, oh, my goodness. Will, it, will they move? Will the parts move? You know, the joints. Um, all kinds of mental anguish in living life. You know, it's just uh, the stresses of interpersonal relationships, the, the mental illnesses, you know, bipolar and depression and things like that. That's a huge inner suffering that people, people frequently have. Then there's accidents. You talked to Carl. You had a little accident a few years ago. And of course, death. Right? 
So, so that's just in the normal course of life, that is pretty much going to be there for everybody. Pretty much none of those things can we avoid. So we shouldn't be too surprised that there is a cost to discipleship when following Jesus and you know, there might be some suffering involved. So I, I just tried to think of some of the things that may put people off or may, may scare people about being a follower of Jesus. Um, hopefully this isn't one of them. <laughs> holy living. You know, we're called to holy living, which means getting rid of those things which are, are destructive or self-destructive or destructive to others and, and, and learning to do those things which are, which are servant-like. So serving others. So it's, it's a move from a self-centered life to, to a life of, uh, of goodness. Um, not only goodness as moving away from evil, but also goodness as, as in the doing good to others. So, you know, that may, that may be hard for some people, that, that transition. <laughs> but in, in the long run, it's super healthy, and it's super satisfying, and it's super joy-bringing. So there may be a little cost to it, but it, it's, it's, it's the way to wholeness. It's possible that if you follow Jesus, you may lose some family or some friends. Not that you, they're killed, but that they, they turn away from you. They'd say, oh, they've gone religious. You know, you, you heard it? Oh, they've gone religious. I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> well, they're, you know, I, I'm not, I don't like to think of myself as particularly religious. I don't like the word very much. I am radically following Jesus, or at least I hope I am. And that puts some people off. They say, that's just not, not, not my cup of tea, so I don't want to get too close lest I get infected with that. Uh, persecution still happens. And it can happen in very subtle emotional ways. The, the, actually, the one above is kind of, you know, that's kind of a kind of persecution. Persecution can happen in a lot of ways. Because people, people say nasty things about you. People uh, slander you. People may want to hurt you or just say, call you names. Uh, in par our part of the world, we're relatively safe from this. Lots of parts of the world, as you know, people suffer a lot for being Christians. We just, was it just last week or the week before where there were Christians... Uh, had their heads chopped off in Sudan or someplace, and the Egyptians were, were Egyptian Christians. That's persecution, still happening. Um, yeah, people lose their lives, their homes, their, their freedom all the time. Self-denial. This is kind of what Jesus is talking about. Take up your cross, kind of apply it to your soul, your selfness, all that. And it's, not just, it's not just evil, but it's, it's the inclination to just do what I want. And, and to kind of aggrandize myself and my, my being and not be in submission to my maker. And the, there, there's a cost to that. There's some pain. And I just put a general corrective discipline in here. <laughs> uh, because it, once Jesus is your, your Lord, your Savior, you're a, son, a child of God. God is your Father. Uh, and uh, Hebrews, I think it's Hebrews chapter 12, says uh, uh, he... He chastens every son that he receives, or daughter. If we are without discipline in which all have participated, we're illegitimate children and not sons. All, all, all discipline at the time seems painful rather than pleasant. Remember when your dad and mom did something to you? Back in the day, they used to spank us. <coughs> that seemed painful rather than pleasant. Later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who are trained by it, Hebrews 12. So, yeah... God uses all kinds of things in our circumstances and in our relationships and in our bodies to, to discipline us, uh, that we might, be, we might share his holiness, as it says. So these are some of the costs of discipleship. Are, are they really, really that too heavy to bear? I mean, they, they, and some of them are there in varying degrees from time to time. Um, we're always called to be holy. We don't usually get persecuted, for instance. So th these are there in varying degrees. Um, that guy's carrying a cross. Because, <laughs> you know, I, I just mean, that's what the cross was when the guy, remember when Jesus took up the cross and then they put it on this other guy, Simon of Cyrene? He, the, all the pictures, if you look online, the pictures of the whole great big tree with the crossbar and the guy's dragging it along and it weighs two, 